Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite you to join us for this conversation with Elliot Mintz. The day this was recorded, I flew out from Atlanta to Los Angeles, California, and after seeing some of the sights and sounds, I was invited into the home of Elliot Mintz in Beverly Hills, California. I'd like to invite you all to join us for this conversation, recorded in front of a roaring fire with a glass of red in my hand and a glass of white in his. So I invite you to pour whatever your beverage of choice may be and join us for this interview recorded in his home. It's not every day you get to welcome someone who influenced you. And that is happening tonight with our special guest, Elliot Mintz. Elliot Mintz started in the world of media as an underground radio personality and became known as a very major press representative whose clients have included Bob Dylan, Don Johnson, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, and others. Elliot, thanks so much for making the time to do this. It's a pleasure. Oh, the pleasure is mine, and uh, it's a delight to meet you. Who is Elliot Bintz? I guess it depends who you ask. I think most stories are best from the beginning. Where were you born, and what was life like growing up? I was born February 16th, 1945, in the Bronx, raised in New York, lived there until I was 17, 18 years old, caught a plane to L.A., where I've been ever since. My recollections of my childhood are always sketchy. I can give them to you uh, in non-sequiturs. I have one sister. My parents were deeply loving people who were married for over 40 years. I lost my father recently at age 99. My mother uh, passed in her 70s. I never recall the two of them having an argument. It was a kind of 1950s Norman Rockwell childhood. As far as I can tell, I can picture barbershop poles on the street corner of the neighborhood, the local pizza shop where I saw my first Wurlitzer jukebox and where I probably first heard Elvis. There was a park not far from where I grew up in the apartment, two-bedroom apartment, and I would like to take long walks in the park. I was a terrible student, had an awful stutter. My stuttering uh, resulted in me having to take speech therapy classes, which is one of the reasons I speak this way. When I first decided I wanted to be a DJ, you, know, you always try to overcome the things you can't do. It's like the people who lose their limbs and decide that they want to find Mount Everest. Well, I used to talk like that, not make fun of people who stutter. So I sounded. And besides t talking like that, I had a New York accent because it's the only place I have been to, street corner. So early on, I wanted to get beyond the limitations of expression and maybe expand it somewhat. My childhood was neither happy or sad. It was um, solitary with few friends, poor scholastic grades, lots of reading, Lots of reflection, endless hours in movie theaters. You just mentioned Elvis a second ago. What music did you fall in love with when you were young? My parents had one of those gigantic radios in uh, in the living room. A very modest apartment in um, 190th Street in Manhattan, not far from the George Washington Bridge. Father lived in that apartment till the end of his life, all of his life. But there was this big mahogany device with that giant speaker in it, you know. Could have been a Grundig Majestic, I forgot what it was. And I grew up listening to 50s music. First, doo-wop, which I love to this day, which I heard in high school when people would go into the bathroom to create that great early uh, reverb effect off the tile walls and do the great doo-wop classics that the Five Satins and the others did. My parents came in at the end of the uh, Frank Sinatra experience, and the dawn of Doris Day, and uh, the hit parade, and the smoke gets in your eyes, and a very innocent time in America. And I would listen to little bits of that coming through the radio without being a great deal of attention to it, until I heard Elvis, and uh, that changed everything. And from that point on, I would listen to the basic music of the 50s. 
if you pick up any one of those uh, classic albums of the uh, 100 of the top 50s hits from the 1950s, that's what I was listening to. And that slowly segued into, probably like most people, from Elvis to two people, Dylan and the Beatles. You mentioned a minute ago, you said you made it out here in L.A. What was it that brought you out here? There were two major factors, Paul. One, because it was such a miserable student in school and was left behind in every grade, had to attend summer school every summer. Finally got out of the uh, high school with a 66 average after, I think, five years. IQ is about 10 points lower than the national average. I'm not a smart person. I, of course, applied to every college that I could, was obviously rejected by all of them, except the Los Angeles City College, a community college in L.A. So one of the reasons I wound up here was I was invited by a school when all the others turned me down. The second reason was I, when I was around 16, I saw a movie called The Misfits, the last movie ever done that starred Clark Gable and Marilyn Monroe before they died. The movie also included uh, Montgomery Cliff, Thelma Ritter, Eli Wallach. It was written by Arthur Miller, who was married to Marilyn Monroe at the time. He wrote Death of the Salesman. It was about uh, a dying breed of uh, cowboys trying to make the transition from wrestling or roping wild Mustang to sell to wealthy Texans as Christmas presents to their children to roping wild Mustang to sell them to the dealer, put in dog food containers. And there was something about the essence of the misfits, which I've now seen a hundred times, my favorite film, Casablanca is my second favorite. It was my first view of the West, and I knew I wanted to be there in some capacity. And the third was I wanted to get out of New York. So it was those three things that moved me to get on a plane one day and come to a place that they'd never been to before, knew nobody, and uh, try to give it a start. So you came out here, you don't know anybody, and then from there you become a part of this Los Angeles music scene and you become a disc jockey. What led you down that path? Well, Los Angeles City College fortunately turns out to have had one of the very best broadcasting departments in America. And it was free. It was a small class, 30 or 40 students, and I studied everything having to do with broadcasting. I, I wanted to know how to broadcast. I wanted to learn how to um, do the weather, how to operate a camera, how to be an engineer, how to do news had to do everything having to do with broadcast, to work on losing the New York accent, to work on losing the stutter, and I gravitated to a particular area in broadcasting, which was interviewing. I found myself all consumed with the study of how to conduct a meaningful interview. And there was a little college radio station, KMLA, that if you open the windows really loud and open the, the windows really wide and spoke very loud, you could be heard to the lunchroom. And the students would practice that way. And I started practicing by interviewing people on KMLA. I was 18 years old. It was um, a preview of coming attractions. I enjoyed listening. I believe that everyone had a story to tell. I believe that most people were not willing to give up their story without some degree of an acoustic environment that suggested, I really want to know. And I learned my first lesson in interviewing, which was, ask the question, shut up, get out of the way, and let the guest respond. After a year or two at KMLA, I just uh, applied to a variety of local radio stations and was accepted by one, KPFK, which was a listener-supported station, the, part of a group called the Pacifica Foundation, a station in New York, in Texas, in Berkeley, etc. And people who liked what they heard just sent them a check. It's kind of like PBS and that kind of thing. 
I was 21. I was the youngest talk show host in America. And I began doing nightly radio shows, uh, interviewing the culture icons of the time. After a year or two there, I went on to do the same basic thing on seven or eight different radio stations, commercial stations, and then on to television, but talking to people. My guess is I interviewed over 2,000 people. I also took phone calls from listeners and estimated 20,000 on-air phone calls as well. And in the process, over a 10-year period, I tried to learn my craft. Throughout the course of you doing radio, when you were on the air and when you were doing these interviews, what were you trying to accomplish out of that? What did you want the listener to get out of the experience? The essence of the person I was speaking with. I viewed myself as a conduit. The guest speaks to the audience through me. I was not there to uh, judge or to argue or to quarrel. In those days, FM radio, you could sit and talk to somebody for two or three or four hours. Today we have now reduced a sound bite to a sound bark. we got about three seconds to get an answer out. I would be terrible on today's radio. Nobody would pay any attention at all. See, Paul, I've always believed that if somebody has something to speak about that touches your life, your heart, your experience, there is a valuable exchange because you get another point of view. I wasn't that big on the exclusives. I wasn't that big on just racking up how many famous people I could get. Some of my more memorable interviews for me personally were with anonymous people who had something to say, as opposed to extraordinarily famous people who had nothing to say. When I say they had nothing to say, I append that by saying that they had nothing to say through me. There are some musicians who can create these sensory perceptions through lyrics, instrumentation, music, but they don't talk because all of their brilliance and wisdom and inspiration comes through a very tiny aperture. Just like there are some great writers who can write but can speak. There are a zillion great speakers who can carry a tune and can't write a book. So I wanted to probe, I wanted to explore and felt that there was a, a camaraderie of interest here between listener, myself, and guest. And perhaps something good would be spoken, and optimistically, maybe something would be learned. You just mentioned that many times the person that you interviewed, they weren't the most famous person. I'm very curious to know, was there anyone that you always felt you could have gotten something good out of that constantly eluded you? that you, you couldn't get them. I would have loved to have spoken with Marilyn Monroe, but I arrived in Los Angeles shortly after she had passed. So shy of a seance, I couldn't have interviewed Marilyn, but I always wanted to. On my wish list, there were three or four unfulfilled interviews. We all have them. You're a radio guy. You've got a secret list in your back pocket of the three or four people who you just, before you hang up your microphone, you've got to sit down and talk to them. We all got it. We all got it. For me, it was Elvis, Howard Hughes, the Pope, and Mother Teresa. Those were the four, if I could sit down and broadcast the essence of who they are, It would have been extraordinary, all for different reasons. I can't recall anybody else who I really wanted to talk to who I didn't get a chance to talk to. Well, on the other side of the coin, can you name maybe three or four people that you were elated to interview, and when you were done, you thought, this is great. There's nothing better than that feeling. There were some anonymous people at the time, 
like a man named Jack Garris, who was one of the um, creators of a device called the Bioscope. He taught me more about meditation than anybody who I ever met. And I've been uh, meditating uh, for 30 years. Jack was an anonymous person when we met, but was one of my favorite interview subjects. He would be an example of somebody who people would say, Jack who, but if they listened to the broadcast, it could change their lives. In terms of the ones where you did the interview and you drove home that night and felt that something meaningful had occurred, the first time I spoke to Yoko, the first time I spoke to John, the first interview I did with Bob Dylan, then I have to scratch my head. I mean, those are three that uh, you know, jump off the page at me. But there were writers like Norman Mailer and Ray Bradbury. There were mystical people like um, Baba Ram Dass and Alan Watts. There were iconic figures like Salvador Dali. There were an endless list of musicians, actors, sitting in Jack Lemmon's trailer when I was 18 years old and him agreeing to talk to a kid from school knowing it would only be heard at L.A. City College after he had been nominated for Days of Wine and Roses. An afternoon that I spent with John Wayne. A day I spent with Groucho Marvis. You don't have the time or the tape, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have the recollection to go through all of them. But each name that I just mentioned, when I drove home, and sometimes on the way home I would put the tape recorder on play so I could listen to how it sounded before I would get to the station. And uh, there were moments that just propelled me. Partially being in awe of the person or persons that I spoke with. Partially because they said something that I would never anticipate that they would say and primarily because I felt such good fortune to have had that opportunity. On the note of Yoko Ono, you mentioned her as one of the interviews that you felt was especially meaningful. If my memory is correct, you interviewed her around the time that the book Grapefruit came out. Is that correct? I'm so bad with numbers, I can't do the times table. So, Grapefruit had already been written. Right. I had read Grapefruit. I recall that she had released an album called Approximately Infinite Universe, which I listened to and I found I was transfixed by it. Approximately Infinite Universe, Grapefruit, as well as Yoko's involvement in bed ins and the rest of it, she captured me. I mean, there was something about the essence of what was coming through. Whenever I heard her public pronouncements, I was aware of her long before we spoke. But she sounded like a completely original woman. There is a term that has legal meanings and it has philosophical meanings. It's called derivative. But some people believe that all work is derivative, something that preceded it. I don't know if that would apply to the space program, but people say it does apply to rock and roll that was an outgrowth of rhythm and blues. There are definitely progressions with Yoko. I'm going to pour you another glass in a second. I'll finish talking about Yoko. All right. I heard her say things that I had never heard expressed before, and I really needed to speak with her. I really needed to hear more. And the first interview that we did, it was a telephoner. I was in a local station. She was in New York. We spoke on the telephone for an hour. When I got off of the phone, I just knew that I had met somebody unlike anyone I had ever spoken to before. In that sense, I probably shared the same experience that John did when he first had his encounter. You refresh your glass. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm Cabernet Sauvignon. By Essex. What, what am I drinking now? Uh, you're having a Cabernet Sauvignon by 2009 Esser from a California vintage. And I'm drinking a uh, glass of Mekon Village 
Chardonnay, but this year is uh, the 2019 Louis Jadot. It's basically the house wine. I have a bottle of this every day. You're on red, I'm on white. <laughs> but uh, all roads lead to the same path. I suppose, ironically, I'm wearing all white and you're wearing red. <laughs> That observation had escaped my attention. There's a book. Uh, I'm quite fond of this book. It's called Memories of John Lennon, and it was compiled by Yoko Ono. And in it, you mentioned that when people ask you what John Lennon was like, that they already know. And that line really struck me when I read it. Were you nervous to meet him? I mean, think about it like this. Here's a Beatle and one of the most influential artists of all time. What's going through your head? Well, I met John on the radio, again, on the telephone. I interviewed him first on the evening of his birthday, live. So we, quote, met, but we met verbally. It's different. You know, we met on the telephone. We talked on the phone. Uh, talking to somebody on the phone... Uh, creates a completely different experience. You're not fixated upon meeting somebody who looks exactly like they looked in the photographs that you had seen of them or the movie or whatever it was. So speaking to him was as natural as natural could be. He was a gracious and accommodating interview subject. He had some experience in this area. He also felt so real. And if one listens to that first interview, the Mintz Lennon interview, there were many that would follow. It was like talking to an old friend. For me, now of course I knew who he was. I think the only thing he probably knew about me was that he had listened to the Yoko Ono interview that I had done weeks or months before. He was also aware of the fact that Yoko and I had struck up a telephone friendship where we talked to each other on the phone after the interview. So he had some insider knowledge as to who this dude Elliot was, but we never spoke until we spoke on the radio live. Uh, that was completely comfortable. It resulted in a telephone friendship with John as well where for weeks and months following the first John Lennon interview, John would call me or I would call John or Yoko would call me or I would call Yoko or, we, or the three of us would virtually every day for weeks or months. Hundreds of hours of conversations. You know, today people do the same thing. They just call it Facebook, right? Right. Before my time, I think it was called Pen Pals. For the, the John Yoko and I, it was just the, the telephone exchange. One day, the two of them drove across the United States from New York to California. They didn't actually do the driving. Somebody drove them in an old car. And uh, John called and said, we're here and we would like to meet you. I admit that when I got into my car to drive to a little community about... Um, give or take 50 or 60 miles of where we're sitting, Paul, a place called Ojai. And John described the car he was in, which I keep calling an old rambler uh, or a station wagon. People have asked for greater identification about the vehicle, but that's all I remember. And I pulled up alongside their car in what I recall to be the middle of the field and turned the engine off and got out and the door opened and Yoko came out first, and John followed right afterwards. John said to Yoko, go on, give him a hug. Yoko is not a demonstrably uh, affectionate woman who just gives hugs and kisses to people. And it was a hesitating hug and a hello. And uh, John put out his hand, and I shook him. And I looked at that face. This was uh, during the working class hero look with very long hair and, of course, the wire rim glasses. He looked like John Lennon. He looked as familiar to me as my closest friends, my parents. I had known him for years. 
There was no nervousness. There was no hesitation. There was no reservation. Now, if we had not had the telephone relationship prior to the meeting in the field, I may have been um, a little hesitant, and maybe he would have been a little guarded. But after a minute or two, he said, So look, uh, we're going to this house we rented. Uh, Just follow us. And I followed them to a house that they were renting, and we spent the day together. And Paul, from that point on, in all those years, eight years, in all those hundreds of hours of conversation, all those visits back and forth, when John and Yoko would come to my house, and when I would visit them at the Dakota, when we would travel, I always knew that I was talking to John Lennon. But I never uh, attached that to anything having to do with Beatlemania or I want to hold your hand or any of that stuff. When we were having conversations, it was just two dudes talking, debating, discovering. The only time that it was different was when we were in public. If we went out to a restaurant and I saw the way everybody else reacted to him and how he, you know, just needed to react to everybody else, that the vibe was slightly different. But the times shared with them privately were as comfortable as me sitting here and talking with you. I was thinking about you a few weeks ago. I was at the John Lennon Art Gallery in Atlanta at the Westin Hotel. At first, I think I spent probably so long looking at all the stuff that they started wondering (laughs) what my motives were. I looked at the artwork, and then I started looking at something altogether different. I started looking at the people who were coming in and how they were reacting, and also who was coming in, Yeah, you know, young people. You've become kind of like Yoko, the voice of John Lennon in this era, you know, and it's it has to be a tremendous responsibility. I thought about that also when I was reading your recollections in the Memories book. What is that responsibility like? Well, let me immediately say that I totally divorce myself of the perception that I am the voice of John Lennon. I insist (laughs) upon that. Nobody speaks for John, and I go out of my way because people ask me frequently, what would John say about uh, the war today? and How would John have felt about George Bush or those things? And I always preface it by saying, I do not speak for John. Right. Never have, never could. Only wish he could be here to speak for himself. Hmm. But in terms of me discussing the relationship between John and Yoko, we were family. My responsibility is to historical accuracy. I am not a John Lennon or Yoko Ono sycophant. I was never the house propagandist. I'm not here to advance any kind of myth about him or Yoko. And John had his frailties as we all did. And I never thought of him as a saint. He was a really good guy who did his best to make this world a little better during the time that he was given to do it. Now, as long as I stay focused on that, I'm okay with it. But I'm no spokesperson for John Lennon. On that note, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Lost Lennon Tapes, sure. which was a syndicated radio program. It, I believe, gathered six to seven million listeners during its peak. I'm told that those were the numbers, you know. I, I don't know who was out there counting them, but <laughs> I heard that. What are you, some of your most vibrant memories from the Lost Lennon Tapes? It's a good question, Paul. Nobody's ever asked me that. Let me do a quick mind scan to see if one comes up. Pour myself a glass of shard. There were hundreds of hours of this broadcast that I did called The Lost Lemon Tapes followed by an additional number of hours called the Beatle Years. I did them for a radio syndication company called Westwood One Radio. 
and they were heard on hundreds of stations once a week. There were one-hour broadcasts. It involved the airing of previously unheard John Lennon material. Rehearsal tapes, demo tapes, spoken arts, partial interviews, at-home recordings where he just left the machine on. This was a time, I'm not good with the numbers, but I think it was 25 years ago, uh, where Yoko had these hundreds and hundreds of hours of material on John, and I represented uh, Westwood One, and I arranged a dinner between a man named Norm Pattis, P-A-T-T-I-Z, who um, created and was the CEO of Westwood One, and Yoko. We went out to dinner. Yoko had the material, uh, Norm had all of these radio stations, and over dinner it was suggested that perhaps there'd be some value in playing the stuff on the radio. And by the time we got to dessert and a discussion about a host, somebody floated my name, one of the two. I said, I accept, and it began. My joy was in listening to the composing tapes in listening to these hours and hours of John with an acoustic guitar or at a piano, figuring out, I'm not a musician, so I don't know what the, the phrase is, the right chords or the right keys in the piano, experimenting with the lyrics, you know, with a little tape recorder, a little Sony on the piano, and listening to the evolution of songs that would later become known to all of us. So the first time that I would listen to a composing tape of uh, Strawberry Fields Forever, or whatever the song might be, it was an accurate re representation and reproduction of John's creative process. And I loved that. Years later, John would wear a little button on his lapel that read, I prefer it in mono. I like listening to recordings. I mention this uh, without any ego attachment whatsoever. Before the Lost Linden Tapes, I can't recall box sets or collections that involved alternate takes, bonus tracks, all the stuff that's now a staple for 5,000 musicians. I think it occurred with some jazz artists, but I don't recall it with rock people. If somebody has information that contradicts that, I would love to hear from them. It was new and it was daring and different to let people hear material before it was 100% ready with the makeup on it. I preferred it in mono. I preferred it in its primitive stages. I loved being the fly on the wall, listening to this experience evolve, and I think that that's what accounted for the popularity of the radio series. Your passion for it, in part. And others that right. would feel the same way. Right, sure. You refresh your glass. Thank you, sir. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. Of the songs that, that John Lennon wrote, and this may be a question you're tired of answering. <laughs> what would you say is your favorite composition? Uh, from the Beatle period or as an individual artist? How about one of each? Okay. As a Beatle, I loved In My Life. There are places I remember. That song grabbed me. In conversations with John, when I would uh, ask him those questions on air, because when we were not on air doing interviews, we rarely, if ever, talked about the Beatles. Uh, John had a great sense of pride about that song. He also felt really, really good about Strawberry Field. He also had really, really positive feelings about uh, I Am the Walrus. Uh, those were the three that when we talked about and I asked him what his faves were, there were lots that he acknowledged as being, you know, well-written compositions and many that he acknowledged as being extraordinary compositions between himself and Paul. Because as most people know, a lot of these songs were Paul's songs, a lot were 
John songs, a number were collaborations, but when they were teenagers, they had a handshake agreement that every Beatles song would be titled a Lennon-McCartney composition. Although, obviously, there are songs like Yesterday that was purely a Paul McCartney composition, and obviously a work of genius. But rather than dividing who wrote who about what, etc., in my life, and uh, Strawberry Fields and I Am the Walrus were my three favorite Beatles songs. In terms of his individual work, Imagine is our collective. We're sitting here tonight in uh, January of 2011, and I note that every time the ball drops in Times Square to bring in a new year, they play two songs to the crowd of a million and the viewers of a hundred million around the world and somebody plays on the loudspeakers first imagining Frank Sinatra in New York, New York. Imagine was the wish, the hope, the prayer, the vision. It is the song that is most, in my opinion, indicative of the feelings and passions, beliefs, hopes, wishes, dreams of John. Conversely, I really took to a song called God didn't represent my feelings, it represented his, but what touched me so much about it was the revelatory nature of the way he expressed his sentiments. Watching the wheels, beautiful boy, dozens and dozens and dozens of others. I was a little old for the Beatle experience. Keep in mind that my teenage years was influenced by Elvis. But by the time I was in my 20s, it wasn't about the Beatles, it was about John and Yoko. And a generation later, for the children to follow, it would be about Michael Jackson. I felt that John did his best work after the Beatles. His collaboration with Yoko, who helped to teach him how to imagine power of imagining struck a responsive chord in my heart. You mentioned a moment ago, imagine. My mother is someone most people would think of as being the traditionalist and the Christian type. And something that she said about imagine is, I'll never forget her saying this to me. She said, imagine is what everybody really feels, but maybe doesn't admit. What an interesting quote from your mom. <laughs> yeah. Aside from that, this I thought was kind of an unusual question. John also had a fine taste in music, and he covered a lot of songs that I thought were awesome versions of, like, Ain't That a Shame, mm -hmm. and so many. Was there a cover that you thought, well done? Absolutely. Especially. Without question, without reservation, instantly, with all due respect to Benny King. Oh, boy. Yeah. With all due respect. When I hear John Lennon singing Stand By Me, it puts the universe in perspective. It was the best cover of that song, just like Ray Charles's cover of Eleanor Rigby was the best cover of that song. Stand By Me by John Lennon was it for me. And if one visits the Rock and Roll album, the one that was produced by uh, Phil Spector, and listens to John's covers, I know a lot of people are dismissive of that. And they kind of feel that, why should John Lennon cover other people's songs when he was such a genius? His genius was recognizing the value of reminding people of these experiences that they may have missed. That was part of his genius. He wasn't some kind of creative hog. If it isn't about me, and if it isn't one of mine, why should I do somebody else's? Those songs, the 50s songs from the Rock and Roll album, were the songs that he grew up listening to in Liverpool via the BBC that led him down the long and winding road. I wondered if you were going to say Angel Baby. <laughs> well... I happen to have a particular love for that song. Mm. I think that Angel Baby, Paul, in, in, in some ways, just based upon what you shared with me a few moments ago, I probably share a lot of your mom's beliefs. Your mom is a devout Christian. Mm -hmm. 
Christy. So she would acknowledge that angels are messengers of God. They are sent here for that purpose. I would think so. I don't mean to misrepresent your mother's feelings, but I, I think that that would be the natural extrapolation. Right. Well, I believe in angels, and I believe that they're messengers of God. And I don't remember how old I was when I first heard Angel Baby. It had to have been, you know, it was in the 1950s when the song came out, or maybe later, but I was just a kid. But when I heard it, it sounded like a choir from heaven. The song is like a song, and if you can clear it through YouTube or whatever you have to do these days to get the angels to sing to people, run it. I listened to it um, in the past eight or nine months on an old world it's a jukebox, which is the way it should be listened to. It's sacred. It's absolutely a mesmerizing song. Yes. Yeah. Especially if you hear it in mono, on vinyl, on a 45 RPM that's not been digitally enhanced, on an old jukebox or an old turntable with the tone arm. It's just like heaven being here with you. It's interesting, John and I never discussed that song. And I attended a number of the rock and roll sessions, the Phil Spector sessions. I don't know how I would have reacted being in the room listening to John singing Angel Baby. So, yeah, Angel Baby, Stand By Me, a toss-up. Yeah. Make one the A-side, one the B-side. One note on that, Rosie, the woman who wrote that song, she said that John's version was her absolute favorite. Did she? Yeah. Which, I can see it. He really embodied it when he sang it. For the record, Rosie and the Originals, original version, my favorite version. Oh, likewise. However, John did write by her. Yoko Ono, she's somebody, her art has been scrutinized by a lot of people. But I'm impressed that she always releases her art and her music. I think a lot of great artists are releasing their work, yes, for their audience, but also to turn themselves on. What motivates her? Again, without speaking for Yoko, because she does that most eloquently on her own, my observation is Yoko attempts always to be true to her own heart. She doesn't sit around with a bunch of consultants to discuss what material should I do, what should I wear, what stylist should I use, etc., to try and sell the most records or get the most recognition or any of that stuff. Yoko is an original, and her allegiance is to her art. Always has been, from day one to day two. Here's what's changed, Paul. The rest of the world caught up with her. I'm not sure of the next statistic I'm about to give to you, but I think, I think, I think, I think that if you went to Billboard and looked up dance singles during the past five years, you would find that dance singles by Yoko Ono have achieved the number one, two, or three position at least a half a dozen times in the past five years. She is a lady in her 70s. Well, on the note of, of Yoko Ono, I'd like to tell you and all the listeners about an experience that I had in Athens, Georgia. I saw Sean Lennon perform. I can tell you it was one of the most moving concerts I have ever seen in my life. I remember sitting there, and I was sitting next to a guy who's a friend of mine. He, he's an attorney, and he didn't get it. You know, and that's cool. And I didn't hear him when he was talking to me. He would talk to me, he would say things, in that, and I was fixated on this concert. What do you think about Sean Lennon? You can answer the question first, and me ask you a question. The concert that you uh, saw... Was that before he and Charlotte formed Ghost of the Sabretooth Tiger? Was he just performing solo? Yes, it was right after Friendly, Friendly Fire. Fire. Yes. An incredible album and incredible video accompaniments that go with it. I'm incredibly impressed with his work. It was a beautiful concert. It was at the melting point, very, very intimate. 
venue. I was blown away by the songs. I commend people's attention to Friendly Fire. It's a package of, of two discs. One disc is just the music, and another disc is what I'm going to call a video. Mm-hmm. But it's not just your traditional video. It's shot like a movie. I think it was shot in 35 millimeter. It has a storyline to it. It's exquisite. Uh, Bijou Phillips is in it. Lindsay Lohan is in it. I make a brief cameo appearance, but you have to look really fast and really hard to see me in it. Friendly Fire was, in my opinion, Sean's primal scream. It was an intensely emotional time for him, and a complex time. In recent years, he has been traveling the world with his girlfriend and fellow musician, and they have a little group. It's them. That's the little group, and the group is called Ghost of a Saber to Tiger. And people can look that up, or just go on SeanOnoLennon.com, and they'll be led to videos and the rest of it. I saw them perform in L.A. about a month ago, and they'll be back here in about two weeks. It showcases their collective genius in composition and presentation. It's a stripped-down, metaphorical, mystical, psychedelic, eternal presence exchange between audience and performers. Harkens back to the days when you would go to a concert, not expecting to see a rock and roll hero, but expecting to be touched, excited, intrigued. And leave in a state of personal reflection. It might be the most unique musical act currently touring the world. I love Sean. I met him when he was a week old. He's 35 now. He's the son I never had. You know, he's an inspiration to me. I cannot say enough about his generosity of spirit. His creative abilities, his、uh, absolute brilliance, his humor, consideration, reverence. I love Sean. I love Sean. He was here last month. You know what we did, Paul? Just before the night of the concert, he was only in L.A. for a day or two. He and Charlie came up to the house. We set up a couple of cameras. I sat and I talked with him for an hour and a half in front of the fireplace that you're probably hearing in the background, and we reminisced a little bit about our 35-year journey together. I'm looking at him. I'm remembering him from the years that he would come out in the summers when he was seven, eight, nine, ten years old and stay with me in Laurel Canyon in my old house. Um, when I would go to New York to attend his birthday parties, our adventures on the road, award ceremonies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours and nights in this room where we're sitting, where we're, we're having our recording or telephone conversation. If you ever have an opportunity to meet and interact with Sean. That's a true gift, but considering the pedigree, it should not come as a surprise. Just a little. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Well, you've talked about a lot of these people, and I have a pretty good idea of who your answer will be. But in your life, what person have you met that most inspired you? I think Jack Harris. Jack Harris. Yeah. Right now, people who are listening to this are scratching their heads and saying, "Who?" When I was、uh, 21 or 22 on KPFK radio, I met this man, who was the man who turned me on to meditation, and metaphysics. He had the most lasting and meaningful impact. Hundreds of people who I met. Who touched me and influenced me for different reasons? For different reasons. Sometimes God places somebody before you 
for a specific purpose, to evoke a special response, to open a new door. And I could give you a litany of them. A guy named Jack Garris, who taught me about meditation, probably impacted me more than anyone I had ever met. I was looking on your YouTube channel. Uh, you can check out youtube.com slash Elliot Mintz videos. It said, uh, for your future, it said, trying to figure that out. What do you see in the future for your life? I have all of these pages. I have the Facebook thing and the Twitter thing and the uh, MySpace thing. And basically, I'm just holding all those pages to avoid the people who pretend to be me and say and do outrageous and embarrassing things. Uh, by the way, virtually everything on the Internet about me at the moment is either embarrassing, uh, inaccurate, pointless, or having nothing to do with who I am. It would be very easy for people to uh, ascertain that in the final stages of completing a website a little late to the rodeo, and that will be the place where, for those who care, you know, that's who I am. I have visited the, the YouTube thing and I have Googled my name and I sometimes feel a total disconnect with that guy who I see on the screen, you know, with the electric blue tie and the spray tan and all the stuff. You know, th th there is a difference between who we are and what we do and there's probably more of a significant difference about how we're perceived. But that's a runaway train. The, the internet in answer to your question about the future I consult tarot card readers and I consult people who have certain gifts about peering over the horizon and sharing with me what they see and in these interactions and interchanges some of the spoken visions resonate in my heart with my own dreams. What's been told to me and what I feel is that I'm in the third act of my life right now. As we sit here this evening, I'm 65 years old. I'm closer to the end than the beginning. And this is Act 3. And uh, the broadcasting years and the media consultant years, they came, they went, they were everything. They were everything. When I wrote that whatever your perceptions of John Lennon were, they were all true, what I was trying to explain was any vision anybody may have had about what Elliot's life was like as a broadcaster in those 2,000 interviews or what would follow with media consultation, those are probably true to them. But my truth is yet to be manifest. If I were writing the script, I don't believe I am. I do believe in predestination. I believe in God's will. I believe that the script has been written. And what I see on the dust cover of the book jacket is, well, a life outside of Hollywood, a life away from show business, a life that would be more rural than urban, a life that would include um, the natural elements that elude us in big cities, horses, oceans. I could see myself teaching some classes in media in a small college for those who would be interested or doing something on the internet where I could talk to people about uh, media issues if they wish to. What I primarily want to do is take all the information that I've learned in 40 years of broadcasting and media consultation and make myself available on a pro bono basis to various causes and charities that I believe in. When John Yoko did the bed-ins, John said what they were trying to do was send out advertisements for peace. And they wanted to use the same devices that Wall Street used to sell toothpaste. Well, I know a thing or two about uh, influence public opinion. 
and media. Instead of applying that to another actor or another actress or another show business personality, I'd like to apply that knowledge to those people who are trying to make this a better world. I see that in my future. I'd like to do a lot more horseback riding. I'd like to meditate more. I'd like to sleep later. I'd like to dream. I'd like to travel to places that I've not been to before just for me, not because I'm tagging along with a client. I would like to explore the mystic more than I have. I'd like to revisit some classic literature that I read too early in my life. I'd like to get married. I'd like to stay healthy. I'd like to be able to be in a position to encourage others to pursue their dreams and not abandon any vision because somebody told them they couldn't do it. And when it's time, I would like to pass gracefully with gratitude. That's what I see in my future. There was, a, I think, a 15th century German mystic named Meister Eckhart once wrote, quote, Man plans, God laughs, close quote. So, you know, what I just put down on your tape recorder computer machine device <laughs> is, uh, you know, Elliot's vision for Elliot. I quickly admonish myself. You can't always get what you want. When you look back at your life full of great people, stories, and events, what is the best thing about being Elliot Mintz? Hmm. Paul, that's another question I've never been asked. You're really good. So rather than give a knee-jerk response, let me reflect upon it for a second. Nothing wrong with a little white fireplace noise. <laughs> look, um... I've received far more than I've given. I am just so grateful to have been put in some place during this incarnation where I could act as a filter or a conduit to others as a result of people that I've met. The best thing about having been Elliot Mintz is that I've been given that chance just been given that chance that I met some extraordinary people and I passed along the information that they bestowed upon me. So I am the uh, CEO of the Cosmic Messenger Service. It's a kind of more ethereal version of FedEx. I accepted the responsibility. I hope I've lived up to the tenets of the job description. And I've lived to see the sparkle in the eyes of those who at one time believed that they couldn't and then ultimately realized that they could. This is kind of a 180, but a second ago, you mentioned that you hope to get married. I've always wondered this, and I, I don't know why I've wondered this. What do you look for in a woman? You mentioned Marilyn Monroe earlier. Are you a Marilyn Monroe kind of guy or an Audrey Hepburn kind of guy? <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, I'm more of a Mother Teresa kind of guy. She would not have been a possibility. <laughs> right. <laughs> she had taken a bow. I'm somewhere between a Marilyn Monroe kind of a guy and an Audrey Hepburn kind of a guy. The ideal, iconic woman for me was always a cowgirl. You know? Oh, yeah. Recently, they had uh, the rodeo competition in Las Vegas, Nevada. Seven days, 30,000 people showed up. Well, you should have seen some of those cowgirls roping steers. Let me tell you, Paul, that would make the heart jump a beat or two. Uh, to be more specific, years ago, I attended a film festival, and I don't remember if it was in Germany or Cannes. I was representing Melanie Griffith at the time. She had been nominated for Best Supporting Actress in a movie called Working Girl. She's a marvelous actress. I've known her for many, many years. She was married to Don Johnson. She's currently married and has been for many years to Antonio Banderas. Tangentially, her mother is Tippi Hedren, who starred in The Birds, the Alfred Hitchcock film. 
Anyway, Melanie and I were at a, um, a film festival to promote Working Girl. And uh, she had done 30 or 40 interviews throughout the day. The last interview that she did, a woman walks into the room where you know, every reporter has five minutes to ask their questions you know, for the country they represent. And the reporter said to Melanie, look, you're very, very hot right now and you're an Academy Award nominee. You receive so many scripts and you're offered you know, fabulous sums to do it. What is the criteria that you use to decide who you want to play? What kind of woman do you look for in the script? And Melanie responded as follows. She said, I look for strong women with open hearts who will back up what they say they're going to do. The reporter thanked her, left the room. Mel and I were both exhausted. I went back to my room in the hotel, and I reflected during the night about her answer to that question. And the following day, I had breakfast with her, and I said, No, you taught me a great Zen object lesson last night. And that was simply that the same things that you look for in a woman in a script for you to portray on movies are the same qualities that I look for in a woman to share a life with. I look for and love strong women with open hearts who back up what they say they're going to do. Now, those three elements with a touch of the cowgirl <laughs> sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. My That's home number is three. Sorry, <laughs> just, just being silly. Well, go ahead. Give the number. <laughs> My two final questions for Elliot Mintz. Some of the best restaurants in the world are here in California, or so they say. I feel you can find out a lot about a person from this question. What is your all-time favorite meal? <laughs> so we've gone from women to meals. Great question. You know, it's not the meal, it's who you share it with. Not only who you share it with, but when you share it. I could give you the list of the top ten restaurants in Beverly Hills or around the world. I've dined in many of them. When I was in my teens or twenties, I took a young lady, the first girl who I ever loved, to a place called Dupar's. It's an all-night coffee shop on Ventura Boulevard. And it was late at night. And we had um, cheeseburgers, fries, chocolate shakes, apple pie with some vanilla on the side. All these years later, I can still taste it. I went for the next 30, 35 years without ever tasting meat. I live off of fish and chicken. That changed a month ago when I had my first bite of meat after, I think, 35 years. But that night at Dupar's may remain my most memorable meal. It was the times. It was the lady. And man, those fries were as crispy as the kind that you used to be able to get in New York. My final question is very appropriate here. Yoko Ono was just talking about John Lennon, and she said he would have loved Facebook and Twitter. In a lot of ways, I think sometimes people focus on the bad side of these things, but there's a good side to it, too. It connects us all. We're able to share messages. We're able to see that people across the country and people across the world we're not that different. This broadcast is going out all over the world. My final question is, what would you, Mr. Elliot Mintz, like to say to all of those people listening in? Mm. Be true to your own tweets. Do your best to express them to people in person. Never feel a need to limit your expression and understand with all the great promise 
of the social networking sites and the wizardry of computers that they can never kiss you, hold you, or caress you, that words can only go so far. In answer to your question, Paul, turn off the machines and be with someone. Well, Elliot, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much. Uh, might I add, um, and I don't want to sound patronizing or anything like that, but I've done a couple hundred of these, you know. You're damn good at what you do. Really, really, really good. And I want to encourage you to continue to engage in this form of inquiry with as many people as you can and share it with as many people as you're able to do so because um, you have the divine gift of posing questions, getting into the way, listening, and giving somebody an opportunity to reveal themselves. This one's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much.